Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From hanselminutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 434. In this episode, Scott talks with Jesse Sternschus about applying improv to agile and lean startup models. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm talking with Jesse Sterenschus from The Improv Effect at ImprovEffect.com. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Lovely. And unlike all of my very organized uh, talks and uh, podcasts where we have an agenda ahead of time, this episode of Hansel Minutes is entirely improvised. We have not prepared because that's what you do all day is you do improv. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> Why would an improv person be talking on a tech podcast? And what is it that you do around improv as it relates to uh, programmers? Because you're, you're at conferences all the time. You're at Ruby conferences, and I met you at a technical conference. Yes, that is true. I've made my way in to find your people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how does it feel? <laughs> Are you spying on us from other... I mean, what is your goal? Don't, don't tell. That that was the strategy. I just wanted to be a, a spy, a low-tech spy in a high-tech environment. <laughs> <laughs> so what does the improv effect do? So um, we do training for a lot of developers or UX um, designers, UX experience um, people. And what we do is we work with them on either communicating more effectively or thinking in a more creative and innovative way. So I feel like the skills that an improviser brings to the table and the skills that a developer brings to the table are sort of creative minds, but of two different types. And so the marriage of those two minds come up with something really interesting. And so that's why I've kind of found my niche among the the developers and the techie world. And is this getting people to think differently? Is it about changing one's perspective? It is. So that's part of it. So I usually like to start with making sure that everybody can communicate first. So if nobody can talk to each other and they're all sort of doing their own thing in their own silo, then there's no reason to be innovative and start solving problems if the whole problem is they can't even communicate. Um, so a lot of times that's where the issue lies first. And then we move on and start to think about problems in a more creative and playful way and try to get them to think differently, but while having fun. Mm -hmm. When I think about improv personally, the first thing that comes to mind is a thing here in the U.S. called comedy sports that people may have seen on shows like Whose Line Is It Anyway, which is a, a, pl a way of exercising the improv part of the brain through, through play. Is that, is that what you're trying to do? Exactly. What I say to people sometimes when I walk into a room of developers and they hear that I'm the improv person, they sort of freak out and want to pitch themselves out of the building. Um, and so what I say to them is, you know, what if we change the word to improvise? You know, how does that relate to what you do every day? And all of a sudden, everybody in the room is like, oh, we do that all the time. So the skills of an improviser, whether they're in comedy sports or Second City, are the same skills that are useful for any person in everyday life. So I'm not asking a developer to put on a comedy show. What I'm asking them to do is sort of fill their toolbox with um, better ways of thinking about things, of problem solving, of communicating with one another, which are all the things, you know, that Second City might be doing on stage. Mm -hmm. For folks uh, who have lis are listening and are not familiar with that term Second City, that's a very famous improv group that created a lot of, you know, famous comedians that have ended up on movies and shows like Saturday Night Live. It's almost an incubator for comedians. 
Exactly. And so, you know, they they all practice the skills of being a good improviser, which is what do they do when somebody throws them a curveball when they're on stage and making up something? Can they go with the flow? Can they think about it in multiple ways? Can they solve a problem without, you know, any notice whatsoever? What they're very practiced at is um, developing their team skills. So they know each other really, really well. Um, and they work together really, really well. So no matter what's thrown at them the night of a show, they can sort of handle it with ease. And I think that those are the same kinds of skills you should have on any team. You know, it's interesting that uh, when I've done improv in the past, one of the first things that people assume is that, oh, well, they're just a natural, right? I'm not a natural, therefore I will never be good at improv. And this person is clearly a natural, therefore they're going to be awesome. But this is a muscle that you have to actually exercise. It is. And, and even so for me, I've been doing improv since I was 10 years old. And I can notice when I take a week off that my muscle hasn't been worked in the same way that it should have. And so it's just like if you play a sport, you know, and you're, you're doing a sport and then you sort of stop to go on vacation and you come back and you're, then you're sore again and you're sort of not as agile. It's the same thing. It's the same sort of thing that you need to develop. So. And also the, uh, the idea of generosity, uh, when I was doing improv, I was reminded that you all have to kind of go with it. You don't want to make it all about you, especially when you're in a team, right? Exactly. So it's all about the team. Oftentimes when people hear improv, they think stand up comedy and that's very different. So improv is all about teamwork and collaboration, which again, I think relates back to, you know, teams of people at work that you're all working together towards a goal and you can improvise to get there. So a plan is great, but usually it gets thrown out the window. It doesn't go the way that you wanted it to. And so the more you collaborate well with each other, the better you can get to the goal. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you try to pull things back your way to make it about you or, but I had a joke that I was working up to and you've messed it up. Exactly. So that to me is like when somebody on your team, I compare that to, you know, somebody on the team thinks they're clever. They have this great way of solving a problem or they have the simple hack, but not everybody else is on board. So it sort of throws the whole process to a halt. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a sense of, uh, it's a kind of selfishness, isn't it? It is. And so again, like the improviser's mindset is all about making your partner look good. Mm -hmm. And, and so we say like, make your partner look good and you look great. Make your partner look bad and you look worse. So it's, it's all about setting up the other people for success and then it will come back towards you. Mm, so that speaks to working in teams. I think about, about tech. One of the things that my boss is really uh, good at is he doesn't make it all about him. He's always trying to make it all about us, the 10 of us that work for him. And he's, uh, he's generous with his, um, with who gets the credit. Mm -hmm. So in the context of improv, like it doesn't matter if the big laugh and the payoff happened because your partner got that big laugh. Exactly. Because in the end, it makes all of you look good. So, you know, if you're, you're getting up there and you're pitching your product, you know, to a bunch of VCs and, you know, there's a couple of you collaborating on that pitch and somebody sort of forgets where they are, Mm -hmm. you know, the worst thing you could do is just like wait for them to like figure it out. Um, It makes you all look bad at the end. So I encourage people to like, you know, step up to the plate. Like if you can sense that somebody's forgotten where they need to be, then you take over and give them a chance to breathe, like be a good teammate. And in the end, you'll all look good for it. Mm -hmm. One of the other muscles that seems to get worked a lot is the idea of keeping the big picture in your head. Um, I, I, there's this term in, in, mm-hmm. in comedy about calling, uh, having a callback. And this is that feeling you get when a yep. comedian, you know, has some joke and then maybe 15, 20 minutes later, they reference it, that joke mm-hmm. from before. And then the audience suddenly is on the inside and the audience is like, Oh, we were all here 15 minutes ago when that, when he told that joke and then he just referenced it. It was a callback. Right. Those things happen when the person who's giving the show is keeping the big picture in his, in their mind and they see an opportunity for a callback. Exactly. Yeah. Or we call that, you know, finding the game. What is the game of this, Mm. of this scene, you know? And so once you find that game, you know, 
your eyes on the prize so you know how to call it back. And I think that relates to having that like end goal, like I said, in mind or strategy in mind Mm -hmm. and, you know, but not forcing it down other people's throats. So, you know, it may be that that goal needs to shift, you know, Um, or that end goal needs to go somewhere else. Um, But sort of understanding how we can get there in multiple ways as a team is the best thing possible. When you're dealing with teams, there's a lot of kind of relationship dynamics. There's people who are trying to push a sense of power or control. Other people are more likely to, to let go. How do you kind of affect and adjust those dynamics to make sure that you move forward and, and, and get what done, what needs to get done? Well, I think first, you know, you understand what the makeup of your team is. You spend time getting to know each other and understanding dynamics. The next thing is like, you know, in improv, we work that muscle of being in the moment and staying present. So we understand that every moment needs something different and we don't just go and attack a problem the same way every time. We're creative with what each moment needs, you know, and then it might be that, you know, we're we're taking the lead or maybe we're the product owner, but, you know, sometimes taking a lead is taking the back seat and letting other people step forward. And you can only know that by a reading the moment and b knowing what the big play is. What is the big end result that you're trying to get to? Yeah. That, that sense of being in the moment and in the one sense, like I mean, I am in this, this minute, this, this, this discussion, but at the same time, where am I trying to take us today, tomorrow, next week, What's our big value? You know, what do we value as a company, as a product, or in the context it, of improv as a skit? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, we make assumptions sometimes based in the corporate world, like based on people's titles or based on the customer, the way the customers acted before, you know, or the stakeholders acted before. But, you know, they may have had a really terrible morning and we think we're going to go out them the same way we always have. But in in truth, that moment needs you to either step up and play like the higher dynamic, or maybe it needs you to step down and let them feel like they came up with all the ideas. You can't just keep doing the same thing the same way every time. So you have to be really able to actively be aware of what every moment needs. Well, and that, that sense of self-awareness, that's a muscle you have to work on. I mean, I think there, yep. there are people to just go through their life, their business life, with a complete cluelessness about how mm-hmm. their actions affect others. Mm-hmm. And, and that's part of what, you know, what we do at the Improv Effect is we come in and use play, you know, and use exercises and experiential learning for them to have fun and be self-aware, like become more self-aware and aware of others, but they're doing it in a way that's non-threatening. So a workshop, if you're laughing while you're figuring that out, that's a lot better than like a very high risk threatening situation when <laughs> it probably would have been better for you to figure out how you come across, you know, much earlier. Yeah. Well, you want to, uh, you want to fail fast. Exactly. And you want to, you want to learn from it. But ag- again, like that self-awareness is key. And I think it's a lot better to find out who you are when everybody's having a good time rather than like be, you know, sent over with the dunce cap in the corner, like to be reprimanded for how you're acting, you know? It seems like companies should do more fun, structured activities like this. I feel sometimes like companies just say, let's all rent a cabin and have a bunch of alcohol. And they call that team building. Uh, This is much more structured. It is. It is. And You know, I have a lot of conversations with clients. They're like, well, we're thinking of bowling or you, (laughs) you know, and I'm like, thanks. Um, So what I think, you know, what we do is is effective to learn all of these outcomes, whether you want to communicate better, whether you want to work better as a team, whether you want to understand your customer, you want to think about your product different. And then a side benefit is you're going to have fun and it's going to be team building. But why not learn? There's no reason why you can't like fun and learning need to be in two separate categories, you know? Yeah, I I think that the bowling versus you juxtaposition that's a that's a little tough. How are we going to grow as a as a family as a team? Right, uh, right. On the bowling alley. Yeah, so great. You know, if if the outcome you want is just like an outing to get away, then good, have fun. You know, but if you actually want to learn something that you can utilize the next day and like get up and start weaving it into what you're doing every day, then why not do something like this and. and enjoy it at the same time, like, you know, laugh to the point of tears, you know, while you're learning. (laughs) I mean, I can't think of something better than that, you know. 
when you when you talk about relationship dynamics and how your how your what your responses how what you do affect your team affect your 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 client uh i know that you've you've talked about the idea of understanding what your natural role is within the team mm -hmm. and then of course mm -hmm. maybe stretching outside your role mm -hmm. what does that mean to find your natural role does that mean like i'm the one that talks a lot or i'm the one that's super quiet yeah so exactly so like in what environments, like given X environment, what do you act like in a typical way? Like, are you, are you a really good listener? Are you the one who's just waiting for your chance to talk all the time? Are you the one who's steamrolling everybody at a conversation? Do you, do you not pipe up, you know, when we have these big stand up meetings? What are you, what are you doing and evaluate that and then play with how you could step up, you know, or step down? Um, and kind of test out what it's like. What kind of response do you get if you put on a different hat? Mm -hmm. You know. But how do you do that in an authentic way? I mean, I always talk about authenticity because I'm a community focused individual. But whenever I'm complaining about this at work, I just kind of like this isn't authentic, and I end up using that word kind of as a as a cudgel. But like you know, I want to be to be real. I don't want to be fake. I don't want to. But at the same time, we are manipulating the situation a salesperson wants to sell a marketing person wants to impress upon the public mm -hmm. with their product how do you be real without being fake well i think first you practice and that's exactly why you know doing a playful workshop to kind of in a very low stakes you know way say like hmm what kind of outcome happens if i if i act like this what happens if i act like that just kind of playing around with it and practicing it to kind of find where you're comfortable and like where you're pushed to your outer limits so that when it's back to like the regular run of the day, you know, you've kind of played around with it and you can still find how to be authentic within each of those situations. That really resonates. What you just said about in a low stakes way, I think the mm -hmm. listeners and folks that are listening to this podcast should think for a second about when do you get to practice some of the skills that you use at work, your communication skills, your speaking skills, your understanding power dynamics and how things work in a group? You know, when was the last time you had, you, you went and met with the CEO of a company you were trying to sell and then said, oh, I, didn't, I didn't like that. Let me, let me try that again and see how you react. That'll be much, that'll be much better. You, you're always in a high stakes environment. Right. And, and the thing is like, you know, companies spend so much money on like technical training and, you know, how to get this and this new, you know, fendangoed, whatever, <laughs> you know, but yet and if they can't communicate what they're trying to solve to other people and they can't talk to each other and they can't think differently, then how can you even like utilize the technical training? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think basically we work so hard to get the tech right. And then yeah. when it comes down to getting the presentation or the, whether it be something like what I do, talk at a, at a conference or mm -hmm. a press release, it's kind of just making it up. You're like, yeah, it kind of mm -hmm. felt right. We'll see if mm -hmm. it works out. Okay. And well, and that's exactly how I've ended up at all these places, you know, is because I think people are starting to realize that like attention should be paid to the people part and the, like the thinking differently and the creativity and that that's just as important as the the other process, you know, and the other technical skills that most of the breakdowns happen, not because of technical reasons, but because people can't like communicate with one another very well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's a lot of talk in the tech space around presentation skills and public speaking mm -hmm. and whether or not mm -hmm. a talk should be educational or edutainment, which is what I call mm -hmm. my personal brand of, of, of yeah. work. Some people have watched my talks and said, well, that was just silly. I, you know, that was just a bunch of jokes. Um, and there's been some really powerful and intelligent people in the tech space who have said that, you know, there's too much personality driven public speaking going on. It shouldn't be about the, 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 the person who's speaking, the entertainer. You know, how do you find that balance between like, I really want to be a great, funny presenter. I really want to convey the message. I don't want to be too dry. But at the same time, I am selling mm -hmm. whatever I'm selling. So, I, I mean, whenever I work with people, I'm putting together their presentations. I always start with the, you know, the question of what do you want the outcome to be? So, when your audience leaves after they've heard you speak, mm -hmm. what do you want them to say, do, and feel? 
Mm. and then reverse engineer your talk back to that and make sure that everything that you put together in your talk aligns back to those three things. If it doesn't, it's, it's fluff and it probably doesn't have to be there. And on, I mean, obviously if you have a longer talk that you can give, you can fluff it up a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have like, you can only give a seven minute talk, then make sure it's just, you know, down to the core and simplicity of making sure it addresses those outcomes that you want for your audience. I I think we pay so much attention to what we're going to say. And we forget that like presenting is all about our audience. It's not about us. It's about them, you know? Um, And so who is our audience? You know, what effects do we want to have on them? And then does this align? So if you want to have the effect of like teaching them, you know, some new programming language, but you want it to be fun and not mundane, then you want them to leave laughing and learning, then having jokes is fine, you know, because it's evoking an emotion that you intended on having your audience feel, right? Uh, so it's the it's the being intentional actually yeah. having a plan. You don't want to accidentally have them laughing at you. No. And if you do, then like, I mean, sometimes that happens, right? We can't control how everything's going to go down in the moment of giving a presentation. I think that's why getting comfortable around improvising is important because we can take that sort of mistake and make it a new like gem of our talk. Like it could be that moment that makes us more endearing to our audience, more relatable to our audience than ever before. So I think, you know, getting caught up in like, oops, they laughed where I didn't want them to and looking at it and beating yourself up about it when in turn, it could have been, you know, the the thing that sort of broke the barrier between us and them, Mm -hmm. you know? It's so, it's so frustrating for me as a person who has to not only give presentations, but also watch them to see people uh, lose control of their talks. Yes. And I just feel like, oh gosh, that's not what you intended at all. No. So, so I am definitely not saying throw caution to the wind and don't prepare. Like I, I think the best thing you can do is prepare to the point of being able to improvise. So that means preparing so well that no matter what happens the day of, you know, the core of your narrative and your message and you know what outcomes you want that you can still get to the goal Mm -hmm. by improvising. And that way you don't lose sight, but you can't do that kind of thing easily if you're not prepared. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely prepared and uh, be prepared yep. for things to fail and what you're going to do when yep. those things fail. And failure yep. might be some code didn't compile, right? or it might be the audience isn't who you thought they would be. Exactly. Exactly. So again, like, can you take that moment that's not going the way that you had prepared for and still remain the expert and get, get to the end, mm. you know, and still have the same outcome that you wanted? What does that mean, being the expert? I know some people have said that, again, don't make it about you, but you you and your presentations and your workshops talk about what it means to be the expert. Yeah, I mean, if you're asked to talk, you're the expert on that subject, right? It's it's your material. It's your narrative. Like, nobody else has that narrative. So you have to own it. And to me, being the expert means, like, both what you're saying is prepared and also that your voice and your body language match your expertise in words. So oftentimes I'll see people that are phenomenal at what they do. Like they're amazing developers, but when they get up to present, I lose all confidence in them because their body language and voice are so distracting that I don't think of them as the expert anymore. All I'm focusing on is that, you know, they're fidgeting with the clicker the whole time, you know, and staring at their feet. So, but is is it too much to ask that everyone be good at, at public speaking? Are we are we are we setting an unreasonable expectation that someone could be an amazing developer and also an entertaining presenter? No, I think again, you practice it just like anything else. Like, like let's say you want to be a Ruby developer, you know, you might take some courses and start learning, and you start practicing, and then eventually, like, you work on a project and you get better and better. It's the same thing. So, you know, if if your goal is that you want to be an expert presenter, you know, go to a user group and. And do it again, like low stakes, low risk, or do a workshop, then do a user group, then, you know, kind of build it up in small steps to where, you know, then you're at the several thousand people conference in front of people by yourself, you know? What, when I wonder why people look at, uh, for lack of a better word, soft skills like this as being so, so magical, this idea that it's it's oh, it's intimidating, you know, code I understand, but uh, you know I can't compile, 
uh, <laughs> my, my talk that I'm about to give, but it really is about intentionality. You, you practice it, you sit down, you do it, and you revise, right. refactor, and recompile. Refactor, you engineer it. That's what I said. Like, look, see what, you know, what is that thing you're trying to accomplish? What is that end product you're trying to build? Mm-hmm. And then you reverse engineer it. I mean, you build, you know, you deconstruct it and build it back together, you know? I mean... It seems like if people think about it that way, then wouldn't one argue that uh, the average developer who has those skills already should be an early awesome presenter? Meaning, meaning if you can break these things down, then, you know, do it. I think that more people should do it. And I think that more people should practice. I, th- I feel like there's so few speakers. Like if you look at the speakers in sort of our world, and I consider myself in your world mm-hmm. in terms of speaking, okay. like I would say like, the majority of the conferences um, during the year, I've spoke with at least five of those people, <laughs> no matter where it is, whether it's in Australia, London, here in the States, because there's just not enough people yeah. like trying. And I think we should encourage people to try and to practice in a low risk way. Mm-hmm. And then eventually we'll get more people and we'll have more experts out there and more people sharing their unique perspective. Yep, absolutely. I, I think that that uh, there are, in some cases, the same people. My, and I, I'm guilty mm-hmm. of this as well, you know. It's like, oh, there's that mm-hmm. there's that guy again, you know. Mm-hmm. I pretty much get mm-hmm. him. And mm-hmm. I have to reinvent myself in, in those mm-hmm. kind of things. But at the same time, I'd like to hear from people who aren't giving giving enough presentations. I'm sure that whatever you, the listener, are doing at work is super interesting. You know, you probably solved an amazing problem last week. Why aren't you giving that presentation on that problem that you solved at your local user group? Yeah. And the thing is, like, if they could just believe in themselves and realize that what they're doing is valuable and share that, we're, we as a community could be so much better for that, you know, to have a diverse group of people that are up and sharing because mm. it is presenting is sharing, you know. Sharing experiences and sharing knowledge. Yeah, I've always said that the thing that got me speaking was the feeling that you get when you've got, you've solved some problem. I used to, people can't see me because we're on a podcast here, but I would be writing something and then I would just kind of like throw my hands in the air like, go! And I'm like, I'm at a cubicle, of course, and I'm looking around like no one else is impressed with what's just occurred in my computer. So then I grab my laptop and I just go kind of running down the hallway because I have to share it with someone. And again, no one, yep. no one cares. I'm just a weirdo with a laptop. <laughs> you just keep running. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, that's amazing. Dude, <laughs> dude, did you see this? And then you got to present it. You got to share it with somebody because it's like, this is so cool. Right. Exactly. We, we exactly. as a community, the tech community should not have any trouble finding people to talk about cool stuff. We shouldn't. And yet we do. You know? Yeah, yeah. And when you say a diverse uh, group of people, we're not just talking about gender and color and culture. We're talking about diversity of thought, different yes. different ways of thinking about yes. problems. Yes, that's how we all become better. We are probably not getting the whole picture about how problems can be solved because someone is not giving a talk. I totally agree. <laughs> My buddy uh, Damian Edwards and I call the developers that we don't hear from mm-hmm. dark matter developers because <laughs> the dark matter you know it makes up the large amount of the universe, but we can't <laughs> prove that it exists. That's great. I think they're out there. I think they're out there. I think they're out there too. If you listen real hard, you can hear them. Now we spoke in Norway, uh, and uh, you were giving talks there. What did you speak on in Norway? So I talked about, um, I did some interactive type of workshops mm-hmm. around um, the way that teams, agile teams interact and helping them interact more effectively and, and solve problems in a more playful way. Mm-hmm. Now, when you do these kinds of workshops and discussions, uh, you're not just teaching, you know, standard comedy improv to developers, you're, you know about lean and lean startup yes. and agile. Yes. You're, you, you not only know the buzzwords, but you live the buzzwords and then apply your, imp- your improv concepts to those, those worlds. Exactly. I mean, I remember like seeing the, an- uh, the agile manifesto for the first time and being like, this is, this is improv, like with the, you know, different lingo. This is exactly what improvisers do. And then the lean startup thing took it even further. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I did a whole talk about how like breaking down the lean startup model, mm-hmm. um, and comparing it to, uh, an improviser's, uh, comedy set 
and how like each piece is just like the same thing as the lean startup model. (laughs) Why do you think that people take concepts like agile and lean and then consequently improv and they, they say, Oh, well, agile is just an excuse to be sloppy, you know, and improv. Well, that's just making stuff up. Yeah. So that's not true at all. And that frustrates me (laughs) to no end. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so I think, I mean, to me, like the core of lean and the core of agile is, is the way that we communicate and the pace at which we do that. And that, you know, that everyone's on the same page all the time or that we're not coming up with ideas based on what we think people will like, but we're getting out of the building. We're actually listening. We're having empathy and we're understanding, um, what people's needs are. And then we're developing something based on those needs, you know? Right. Lean is about, Learn, measure, code, yep. rinse, repeat. But the trick yep. is minimizing that time and not spending right. a and year to learn. You spend learning a day. Right. And that's the same like as an improviser. So let's say we're doing a comedy show. We ask the audience like to tell us about something. So we hear what their needs are. Then we instantly start building that product, right? And we start testing it out. And if the audience claps, and we keep going forward. That's our validation, right? So we know that this is working and we should keep doing more of that. If the audience is kind of like, eh, you know, maybe we found the game of the scene, but we need to kind of shift and pivot to go in a different direction. Mm-hmm. And if the audience isn't responding at all, then we've learned like in real time as fast as possible not to do that anymore and to move on, you know? And to me, that's just like the lean startup. Yeah, exactly. Concept. I mean, the product is, is uh, a happy audience. Yep. And uh, and a great piece of material that you might then take from improv and expand. I'm sure that you've probably had improv skits where you've said, you know, we should do a short video on this or. Yep, exactly. And we all talk as a team afterwards and we say, like, what worked, what didn't? You know, we stand up, we talk about like each part that worked and we say and what didn't work. And we say, OK, we don't want to do that again because that didn't work. So, like, if we failed at something, what can we learn from that so we don't do that again? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I hope that people who are listening kind of get a sense of the intentionality of this and the, the, even though it's loose when you're watching it, there's a formality and a structure to this that is similar to the kind of structure you need to apply when you're doing agile in your engineering environment. Yes, there is absolutely a structure to everything that we do. So, We know, again, we know what that framework is and we know what the end goal is, right? But then we don't know what's going to happen in between. But we have the framework to keep us together. And part of the framework is maybe the game. And part of the framework is us as a team, you know. Um, And we have all of those things to keep some sort of structure. Mm -hmm. So people can learn more about what you're doing and the concepts that you're applying to engineering at improveffect.com. I'll put a link in the show notes. And they can also go out and we'll put some uh, videos of your presentations and and your your things that you've done. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse Sterenshoes, for talking to us about applying improv to the Lean Startup and Agile models. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Music